Hello, my name is Joseph Rickert. Welcome to the COVID-19 Data Forum, a series of public webinars and discussions focused on the role of data in responding to the pandemic. This forum is a collaboration between the Stanford Data Science Institute and the R Consortium. Today's discussion will explore the ways in which data journalists are contributing to combating the pandemic. These include uncovering and vetting difficult to find data, helping researchers explain the relevant science and producing data generated charts and visualizations to help ordinary people come to grips with the shape and seriousness of the pandemic. Today, we will hear from three speakers, Mark Hansen, David and Helen Gurley Brown, Professor of Journalism and Innovation at Columbia University, Anna, Carolina Moreno, senior data journalist at TV Globo in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and Megan Hoyer, director of data reporting at the Washington Post. Our moderator today will be Dr. Arena Wang, a data reporter with ProPublica. Dr. Wang holds a PhD in electrical engineering as well as a master's degree in data journalism. Among her work is the May 5th, 2020 article a comparison of four major COVID-19 data sources, which was featured by Big Local News. This article was an early resource for journalists describing how to obtain data from Johns Hopkins University, the COVID Tracking Project, USA Facts, and the New York Times. So we will be taking questions uh, as we go along and the moderator will um, decide when the questions will be posed. Please put your questions in the Q&A at the bottom right of your screen. So now please welcome Dr. Wang. Thanks so much, Joseph. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, it's great to visit my alma mater virtually and I'm so pleased to introduce the guest today. So we're gonna kick things off with Mark Hansen. Um, Mark is a director of the Brown Institute for Media Innovation and a professor at the Columbia Journalism School, where he teaches data and computational journalism. Before joining Columbia University, he taught at UCLA and was a member of Bell Labs Research. Um, and sorry if this wasn't clear, but we're going to be doing a few presentations first, so we'll kick things off with Mark, and then we'll be hearing from Carol and then Megan. So Mark, um, stage is yours. Um, great. Thank you so much. Um, let me just queue up my screen here. Um, sorry, should have been prepared. Um, thank you for inviting me to, uh, to be part of this um, panel. Um, I just had too many screens open at once. All right, we're set. Um, uh, thank you, Arena, for, for the introduction. And uh, thank you to the organizers for allowing me to speak today. Um, uh, or maybe inviting me to speak, allowing seems like they don't let me out of my cage very often. Um, uh, I'm uh, supposed to be teeing things off and telling um, a technical crowd a little bit about what data journalism is all about and then specifically then work toward um, uh, uh, hint toward uh, some of the work that, um, that, that data journalists have done um, specifically around COVID. Um, and then the other two speakers will be reporting more from the trenches, say. Um, I am a professor at uh, Columbia and will give a perspective from uh, having to educate a new generation of data journalists. Um, as Arena pointed out, I am uh, uh, director of the Brown Institute at uh, Columbia Journalism School. Um, we're in fact a bi-coastal organization. The other half of the institute is housed at, uh, I'm, I'm gonna say here at Stanford, even though I'm sitting on Cape Cod and everybody's everywhere, but I think technically we're supposed to be in, uh, in we're supposed to be at Stanford. Um, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, so, so the Brown Institute is half Columbia, half Stanford, um, Columbia Journalism, uh, Stanford Engineering. Um, and our mission is to explore the ways in which um, uh, 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 technology and journalism might influence one another, um, changing the priority, research priorities for engineering and perhaps the, the practices of journalism. 
Um, so I, just to fess up, um, I am a statistician by training. Um, my uh, doctorate's in statistics. I spent 10 years at Bell Labs, 10 years at UCLA. Um, I've been now 10 years in the journalism school. I'm more a spy in the house of Pulitzer than anything else. But I have learned a lot over the last 10 years. Um, and for my corner of the data world, this is overly wordy. And this is the only slide that will have this many words on it, I promise. Um, but I thought I needed to get it right. Um, uh, data and data technologies have new social relevance. And almost every aspects of our, aspect of our lives can be rendered in data. Um, these stories often, or these data often tell us stories about who we are and how we live, but because they are products of human attention, innovation, and memory, their perspective isn't neutral and the stories they tell are often incomplete, open-ended, and biased. Movements in reproducible research and transparency have meant that data are plentiful. Some would argue that data journalism uh, or each incarnation to date um, has flourished precisely because of the prevalence of data about people, businesses, and governments. But in all cases, we uh, also have to mind the gaps. Um, journalism is called on to combat the misuse or invention of data and analysis. Um, misinformation, um, uh, a subject under, is an, a subject under intense scrutiny um, by the profession at the moment. Data and the networks they circulate across can either reinforce or challenge systems of power. And so in a very real sense, our democracy depends on the public being able to think critically about these technologies, telling good stories from bad. And journalists, as truth tellers, sense makers, and the explainers of last resort, um, need to understand the workings of data in society and the ways in which data code and algorithm function. Journalists are becoming more and more bold in producing their own data uh, collection and analysis, borrowing uh, widely from different disciplines. Um, we've assembled a powerful toolkit for finding and telling stories with data. Uh, these acts of journalism are also contributing substantially to the data literacy among the general public. Uh, but data journalism is in, not in any way new. Um, uh, uh, Pulitzer himself in 1904, um, in his college of his paper called College of Journalism, uh, mapped out what journalists uh, uh, need to be taught. Um, uh, and this, by the way, is the school that I, I teach in. Um, and he mapped out uh, law and ethics and history, which we all still teach today. Um, but he also mapped out statistics. Um, he wrote, everybody says that statistics should be taught, but how? Statistics are not simply figures. It said that nothing lies like figures except facts. You want statistics to tell you the truth. You can find truth there if you know how to get at it. And romance, human interest, humor, and fascinating revelations as well. I, I love this quote from him because in this moment, um, uh, Pulitzer sees tremendous narrative possibilities in data. Um, he sees romance, human interest, humor, fascinating revelations. Of course, there's, there's his adherence to the truth or his, his need for the journalist to put truth first. But the idea that, that data contain, uh, these contain rich stories about, as I said before, who we are and how we live is, 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 is quite shocking, especially 1904. And if you think about 1904, um, Fisher was like 14 years old at the time. So statistics wasn't even statistics. Um, uh, so he might, I mean, I think in, our, in the way we're thinking of things today, he might be Pulitzer might be more referring to kind of sort of data and data science as opposed to formal statistical inference, but, but you get the idea. Um, at Columbia, just to give you again, a sense of like the, the terrain of data journalism for, for those who don't know much about it, we, we offer a master's of science degree. Um, we also have a dual degree with computer science. So in two years, you can get a degree in, in computer science and a degree in journalism. And I myself teach uh, something called computational journalism in the J School, um, often as part of a six university consortium um, where we bring engineers and journalists and designers and um, uh, uh, in total six, six different departments together from six, six different schools across, the, um, across, uh, across Manhattan. Well, I guess also Brooklyn. Um, uh, 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 the sorts of things we teach, um, and I apologize that the next couple slides are Python and not R. Um, oh, actually, the, the, the motivation for the teaching um, uh, uh, comes from the idea or the basic observation that, that I've made over, over the last 10 or so years, sort of teaching and refining the teaching uh, my teaching um, uh, at Columbia is that data journalism or computational journalism is not just so much more data analysis. It's a hybrid practice that's steeped in a reporting tra tradition. And 
for those of you not familiar with what reporting might mean, um, I have a quote here from Philip Isle from a, a piece in the Columbia Journalism Review, um, where he's reporting sort of, he's talking about the act of reporting and in particular a reporter's notebook. The, the piece is called Ode to a Reporter's Notebook. And he says, reporter's notebook, the reporter's notebook is a low tech device that I use to capture the sights, smells, sounds, feelings, tastes, and other impressions of the world. The, the piece of this quote that I love is, to report is to be alert and alive in a particular time and place. To report is to be alert and alive in a particular time and place. What this is asking us then is, is when we're thinking about, about bringing computation to journalism, um, uh, 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 we're taking that um, basic curiosity that we're cultivating in our students' minds. Um, uh, we're, we're cultivating a, a curiosity about the world, a kind of restless questioning spirit that, why, that, that asks why things look the way they do. And what we're doing with computational journalism or with data journalism is adding computational lines of inquiry to that habit of mind, that questioning of why things look the way they do and are they fair and are things working the way they should. Um, so if you take one thing from this presentation, it's that, um, that, uh, that a reporting practice uh, as a call to be alert and alive in a particular time and place um, uh, means for me and my teaching that um, computation simply extends that alertness and curiosity to the virtual world of data code and algorithms. Um, the kind of teaching I do, uh, it's either R or Python, and I happen to have some Python notebooks here, um, basic introductions to Python, how the web works, um, some machine learning, uh, maybe some using some APIs, maybe learning a little bit about bots. Um, we're not the only ones doing it, of course. Um, uh, Cheryl Phillips, who I see is in the audience, um, and Charles Barrett, who, who was a graduate student at the time at Columbia, wrote a, a lovely report about, about um, teaching data and computational journalism um, and the state of that teaching in the United States. Um, if you want to learn something about computational journalism, you, you just missed um, uh, uh, the NICAR meeting, uh, 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 National Institute of Computer Assisted Reporting, um, where you'll find uh, topics like um, uh, uh, visualizing data, uh, using data to report on climate change, um, finding needles in haystacks with fuzzy matching. You get a number of topics that will, for the technical people in the audience will resonate with you, but then to think about how to apply that in journalistic context is interesting. Um, at the Brown Institute, we also have a, a, an educational mission where we put on events um, uh, and try to bring in uh, sort of computational ideas to the journalists and have them think about computation differently. Um, this year, we sponsored a uh, program called Changing Course, um, where we had Catherine D'Ignazio and Lauren Klein talk about their book, their new book on data feminism. And uh, Redieta Bebe um, uh, spoke, uh, who's just joining uh, Berkeley, spoke on computing and social change. We've had um, events to introduce students to public data, uh, where we had, say, the chief science, uh, the chief statistician of the United States, um, the chief demographer of, of uh, New York City, um, and then uh, a panel of, of data journalists. And the day kind of went, we are here to give you data, says the federal government and the, the state authorities. And then the data journalists are like, nah, not so much. Um, we also sponsored various kinds of partnerships between different groups. Uh, in this case, we, we put out a call for partnering uh, official statistics organizations and journalists to better inform the public. Um, more COVID related, the Institute has um, spent time um, trying to figure out how, how to respond um, in the way that you know, through through the kind of work that we do, um, one of the things we put on um, during the uh, the um, uh, sort of the beginning of the pandemic was something called at home with the Brown Institute, where we basically led computational journalism courses. Uh, here's a, a two hours on bots. Here's two hours on, um, on on Unix tools. Here's two hours on web mapping. Here's two hours on data visualization. Um, trying to bring these skills mostly to the alumni of the J School, um, get their, get, you know, whet their appetites to learn more about, about computation and bring it to their reporting practices. Um, these are just sort of screenshots of all of the different um, uh, pieces that we brought together. Um, and then we had a series of micro grants where we tried to pair um, or, or we looked at uh, uh, supporting people to um, to uh, better inform the public about the um, about the, the pandemic and about um, 
uh, what it means to them, um, uh, to the lo local communities. Um, we had, um, there were $5,000 awards each, but we had over 325 proposals come in from around the world. Um, uh, uh, and the winners were everything from s stories um, about say, what would happen if um, during the pandemic, we had major flooding along the Mississippi River um, to uh, battling um, uh, misinformation in rural Southeast Alaska. Um, we also held very early sort of talks about, about how bringing together epidemiologists and journalists to try to see how we can sort of meld our skills um, to be able to tell uh, uh, stories and help, um, uh, help the public better understand where we are. Um, you know, in terms of the actual reporting that was going on, um, you'll see this probably more from, from the next two speakers, but you see these are two uh, New York Times uh, front pages from, um, uh, from uh, uh, March, uh, March of last year, um, March 20th and March 27th, I think. Um, and you see the, the kinds of graphics we were starting to look at and the kinds of things that journalists, the data journalists were, were struggling to, to, to pull together. So we have a series of maps at that time, sort of bubble charts were, were a thing. Um, you also see journalists struggling with how to express scale. So this is sort of job loss um, uh, in the US uh, as of at the end of March of last year and trying to reflect uh, scale. Um, and then trying to show what might happen de depending on different conditions that take place. Um, uh, uh, as I mentioned before, journalists also spend time looking where there isn't data and trying to, to, you know, places where no one's incentivized to collect data and trying to collect and add to it. So the COVID tracking project is one example that came from the Atlantic. Um, we sponsored a project called Documenting COVID-19. Um, uh, it's an open website um, that uh, uh, has been doing, um, the team has been uh, uh, putting together FOIA requests to Freedom of Information Act requests to, um, to uh, state and uh, local um, uh, uh, health departments and governments to try to figure out or, or to try to collect emails um, among elected officials um, or government officials who uh, uh, that mentioned COVID in some way. Um, this this trove of documents has been responsible for over 60 stories um, in various outlets from front page uh, New York Times articles, in this case about the meatpacking uh, industry and who knew what when, um, to uh, uh, just last weekend, there was a piece um, in the Chicago Sun-Times um, about just sort of reflecting on the crisis a year into it, um, uh, using very local data from uh, the Freedom of Information Act requests that our Documenting COVID uh, project um, pulled together. Um, sometimes it's big, uh, b sometimes we provide these stories to, to big uh, organizations, sometimes it's smaller, like the Kansas City Star, when um, the uh, uh, coronavirus outbreaks at meat plucking plants were made, were made public. Um, and when this is when our time here is finished, you can jump over to um, uh, look at uh, data journalists who are, are busy fighting for um, uh, public information and how Freedom of Information Act requests work. I feel like I must be at 15 minutes, so I'm going to stop now. Perfect timing, Mark. Um, thank you. That was an incredibly comprehensive uh, overview of data journalism, um, especially as practice at Columbia and and, uh, you know, having come into the world of journalism by way of a technical field like you, um, I really love the philosophical quotes that you brought up, which I think help remind me why we're doing what we're doing, especially during a pandemic. Um, so thank you again for that overview. Uh, I think next we have Carol. Um, and let's see, Carol, there we go. Cool, we can see you now. Um, Carol is a senior data journalist uh, at TV Globo in Brazil. Um, I, I am hesitating because Carol, there we go. <laughs> it's like, we can see her chair, which is also fine. <laughs> but in case, okay, great, I can see you now. Um, Carol currently produces data-driven news stories for the television news programs and has reported extensively on the spread and mortality of COVID-19 in Sao Paulo, which um, as I understand it, Carol, uh, it sounds like you know, I, we watch the numbers here in the US. I mean, I'm watching US numbers, but also in Brazil. Um, I guess, first off, like, how are you doing? I should start with that. Um, 
I'm hanging hanging in there. I guess that's the answer. It's been it's been really hard because we've been doing this for a long time and we've seen the numbers rise and we've seen what was going to happen and now we're seeing it happen. So even in Sao Paulo, I'm in the largest city. I'm in the state that has the most hospitals, the most ICU beds. In the beginning of the pandemic, we had more ICU beds than Italy. And now we're, you know, completely collapsed. So it's very, very hard. I am, I mean, I feel like I'm sorry it doesn't really do enough, but um, you know what? Uh, we're so glad that you took the time to be here with us today. And um, please take it away. We'd love to hear your presentation. Okay, let me share my screen. Um, thank you, thank you very much for having me. I'm, I'm delighted to be able to to share um, a little bit of our experience in journalism covering COVID here in Brazil. Um, I am not from the technical field. I'm not a statistician. I was horrible at math in school, but I ended up in journalism, data journalism, because I covered education. Um, for the TV Global News website, G1, for eight years, and I have a lot of education data. So that's how I got into data journalism. And in January of last year, I transferred teams. So I came to the, the television news um, programming, the local news, um, specifically focused on data journalism. And now that, that's pretty much COVID data journalism. So that's, that's how I got into this. Carol, sorry, one second. It sounds like the audience is having a little trouble hearing you. Would you mind maybe moving the mic a little closer to your mouth? Can you hear me now? Oh, that's beautiful. Um, okay. I'll try to hold the... the yeah, the, I sometimes have to do that too. Thank you. All right. Sorry about the interruption. So, but that's that's okay. Thank you. Thank you for, for letting me know. Um, let's see if I can try and put all the information in 15 minutes, um, just to let you know a little bit because you're not from Brazil. So in Brazil, we have a, a universal public health system that works integrated in, in all the levels of government. So we have the municipal level, um, the state level, and also the federal level, which is the Ministry of Health. That's the, the, our main authority. But they also, they all work integrated and they have, each of them have their own responsibilities. Um, so that's where we get the official data from COVID in, in here in Brazil. But we also have uh, in the pandemic and also before the pandemic, we've had uh, different, um, how do I say, let me, I can't, okay, good. Um, so we've had um, different here, um, as you can see on the right, uh, in green, we have different initiatives from researchers from Brazilian universities and universities outside Brazil that have joined up together to build information and knowledge from those official data sources um, to help fight the, fight the pandemic. And we also have, for example, Infogripe was a platform that existed before the pandemic um, that tracked um, SARS cases in Brazil. So this is, for example, the first platform where, where we could actually see the COVID data, the pandemic arriving in Brazil last year. So we have very important data sources um, and, and they're very abundant actually um, in Brazil. Uh, but I'm gonna show you a little bit afterwards um, some of the problems that we've had access, accessing um, all that data. Um, so uh, we have a lot of information systems in Brazil um, in the health department um, and some of them have um, would already be used that were created for the pandemic. So these are the, I'm just gonna go a little bit, um, an overview of the system that we have um, for COVID right now. So for, for cases, um, we have a system called Civepigripi and also a system that's called Jesus Notifica. Civepigripi is pretty much the main system that we have for data. Um, uh, if we want to look at COVID in Brazil, because it also gives us the, the information about deaths by COVID and also hospitalizations. And for testing, we have a system called GAL that already um, existed before the pandemic that the public labs use um, for, um, um, they use it for tracking different tests that they process. 
and also vaccination. We already had a pre-existing system. Um, as you know, since we have a public universal health system, uh, we have a tremendous popularity. So we have a very strong vaccination program in the country. We have crews that can access all the communities in the country. So that's our strong side. Uh, we only struggle with getting vaccine doses. <laughs> Um, so we can use the whole system that we have right now. Uh, but just a quick overview of CVEPIGDP, which is the main system, the main database that we have. Uh, it was created in 2009 after the H1N1 pandemic. So since then, it's been mandatory for every single hospital, be it private or public, to notify the municipal surveillance authorities within 24 hours every time a person with symptoms of SARS shows up at their hospital. Um, so that was a system that was already being used. It was already in place. Um, and it gives us details of, of each patient. So uh, obviously we don't have access to the full database. We only have access to the anonymous database. So we can't see details that can identify each patient, obviously. Um, uh, but we do have information of how old they are, their gender, their race, the date when they ended up in the hospital, if they went to an ICU bed, if they're under a ventilator, what happened to them if they were discharged, if they died, um, the tests that were performed, the results of those tests. So that's very useful information for journalism and for research purposes as well. And in the pandemic, because we needed a, a place to tally the deaths by COVID, um, this system was already um, it was also adapted to get all the information. So the, the, the surveillance groups, teams, they have to notify this system uh, for every single confirmed death by COVID, even if it didn't happen in the hospital. And ISUS Notifica is another important system because it was created in the pandemic um, to tally all the new cases that we have, um, uh, even if the person didn't need a hospital. So in theory, we even have information on suspected cases. And if their tests came back negative, then we would have discarded cases as well. But uh, we have many, many, many obstacles. I'm going to try to sum them up. I'm not going to um, get into details of those because we don't have time. But if you have any questions, you can ask and we can go over them in more detail. OK, so um, we do have all this, all this information, all this data, but it's not really available. In, in, in a very effective way for us. For example, all levels of government, not just the federal level, they can have access to a lot of this data, but they won't just share the open raw data so we can use um, in a lot of details. So we have some details, other details we don't have. So we have very limited analysis opportunities um, with this data. Um, for example, this VEGIP, which is the main one, um, it's a since it's a node system, we don't have a public API for it. Um, and we only have the raw data once a week. There's only one update a week. That's every Wednesday at 7 p.m. So for example, in my day-to-day -day work, if I'm thinking about a story that I want to produce and it's Tuesday or Wednesday, for example, I say like, I'm going to wait until tomorrow because tonight I'm going to get a better version of the database because that the other version is already one week old and we have the lazy notification. So, so, so it's very hard for us to do our job like this. So we have to program ourselves to get the information as fast as possible with the best available information out there. Um, and the issues, the new system to tally all the cases, it's also very inconsistent because the authorities are overwhelmed. So not all states are able to notify all the suspected cases, for example, or all the discarded cases, for example. And we also have a very, um, I think it's a very lacking testing strategy. We only test the symptomatic cases in Brazil, so we don't trace the disease. Um, we're pretty much navigating a storm without a compass. Um, we actually saw this new rise that we've had in patients in the hospitals. We weren't able to see it coming before with a rising cases, for example, the first rise we saw was hospitalization. So that was very hard. And it's very hard for authorities to actually 
take measures to prevent um, a hospital system to, from collapsing, for example. Um, and we also have, like, we have problems with testing. We don't have open raw data about tests that were performed, PCR tests. Um, we don't really confirm cases from PCR tests. We confirm cases from antibody tests. So the new cases aren't exactly active cases. So it's very um, confusing for us to use uh, most of the data. So we focus mostly on the hospital data uh, because I think it's the most reliable one. And we also have some problems with um, articulation between levels of government right now since things are very unstable and that reflects also on the transparency of those governments, the policies, and the way we can get and use that data. Um, and just finally, I think it, it's worth noting that um, in the beginning of the pandemic, around May or June, uh, the federal government was the only source of new cases and new deaths around the country. Uh, they, they were fed by information from the states, but they were the only ones who gathered the whole information for the whole country. And they decided to change the way they were going to, to um, show the new deaths. They were only going to show the, death, the deaths that were taking place and confirmed within the last 24 hours. And as you know, because we have a delay between the death occurring and the death being confirmed in the systems, that would leave out most of the deaths. So we wouldn't be able to see what was going on in that, in that area. So um, there was actually a never before seen initiative, um, what, what we call a press consortium. So different competing media outlets had to join efforts um, to get journalists talking every single day with every single state authority to get the numbers of cases and deaths and now of vaccine doses. Um, so we have par a parallel tally from the official tally every day. And that's that the parallel tally became our official tally, the one that the one that we use because we can guarantee that there's no risk of it being changed over time or being limited for us to, to see what's going on. So I think that's very important. Um, and on the second part, I would just like to show you a little bit of our day-to-day -day here, um, working in journalism and television journalism. So every, uh, every hour, uh, every day we have 10.4 hours of news programming and four of those hours are local news here in the team that I work. So we have three news shows every day and we are focused on the state of Sao Paulo, which is the biggest one in the country, and mostly on the metropolitan area, which is the largest one in the country and the first hit by the pandemic as well. Um, so this is pretty much our team here. Um, we have 17 news producers in the local news team, and I am the one that's uh, focused on the data-driven stories. So we work together to uh, build up stories and tell the stories. Um, and, and use data to help um, share that information with the public. So we also have a team of designers and a technology team that helps with automation. And also we have the editors and the reporters that help um, uh, get the story on air. Um, and the main thing that we need is getting the data fast. So we do have sort of sources of data, but we needed to automate a lot of things uh, in, a, in order to, um, to get the, uh, to, to help the editors and the reporters and the producers to get the, the information qualified and, and all the analysis that we, we have to do. So we automated all of that to help give them some independence. So um, the rolling average and the trend analysis was something that we started at our local news crew um, in June 1st. And we've been doing that pretty much every single day. Um, and now, as you can see, we last yesterday we had a rolling average of 421 deaths every single day in the state of Sao Paulo, and it's been rising uh, alarmingly. And uh, this is a way that we automated a project. So we just input the the numbers, the total numbers, and it already calculates everything and helps um, bring this um, screen to the public every single day, so they can see what's going on and what's been happening in the past few weeks. Um, we also have indicators um, for the reopening plan. So the state is divided into 17 different regions and each region has their own indicators. So this is something that we've worked really hard to, to make happen. 
Uh, basically, what we do is we get the official data and we get all those rules and we built a code um, to calculate the indicators every single day, every single region, uh, because the government has the rules, the rules are public, public, but they're very complicated, and the government doesn't show us uh, the indicators every single day for every single region, so we have to do it ourselves, and what we do here, our, our strategy has been on a daily basis to create um, dashboard so every single editor reporter or producer can just go on the, the dashboard and get the the most recent data and also look into the history to see what's been going on to see if it's a record number um, to see which regions are doing better which region, regions are doing worse so that's been very helpful on the day-to-day -day basis and that leaves us um, with time to do more special analysis for special stories of the trends that, that are going on. So these are just a few examples. For, for example, this, this is my last slide, okay? I'm almost done. Um, so this one here on the bottom, um, in January, we saw Manaus collapsing. So the lack of oxygen, a lot of people dying, waiting for an ICU bed. And what we saw in the CVET Viki that database was a high number, a very high number of patients that were hospitalized in Sao Paulo, but were residents of Manaus. So we were able to catch this migration in the database and, and write a story about it and find patients. We actually found a few patients that were um, illustrating uh, the data, right? They were proving that the data was real. And here on the, on the top, we, we have um, the city of Sao Paulo has a very big and very strong and, and quick system of mortality information. It's a, it's a model system for, for the country. And so we, could, we were able to show that in 2020, one in every five deaths of natural causes were caused by COVID or were suspected cases of COVID-19 that were never confirmed. Uh, we were also able to, to split the city in this city different districts to show the risk of dying is a lot higher um, in some districts. And that's a problem that we have here in Brazil, which is social inequality. And that, um, so we can prove that COVID doesn't affect the rich and the poor in the same fashion. And one, one uh, analysis that we've been doing since January is tracking the age profile of hospitalizations because we've been hearing that it's growing among the younger people. And we've been trying to track to see when the data actually shows this new trend um, to see what it means. So, so far it hasn't shown, it's still worse among the elderly, but we've been, um, we've been tracking it every single week um, to see when we can see that change so we can inform the public as well. So um, in my presentation, I left on a, uh, a few slides with links to these stories if you guys want to see, but um, that's pretty much it. I think I got 16 minutes. Sorry, Chris. No, that was, that was perfect, Carol. Um, you're right on time. Um, and thank you for that presentation. I, I have to say that even though I've been very attuned to data reporting stories about COVID here in the US, um, I must admit I haven't. I haven't been thinking a whole lot about or had access to data stories, data journalism stories in Brazil. So thank you for that perspective. Um, and so, you know, it was really interesting to hear about the challenges that you faced in Brazil. Uh, some of them were all too familiar, you know, when it comes to newsrooms having to bootstrap data visualization dashboards, um, really galvanizing data collection efforts. Which is why I am particularly excited to introduce Megan Hoyer, um, whom I met last summer when I interned with the data team at the AP. Um, Megan, who was recently recruited by the Washington Post to lead its new data journalism department, um, is an experienced data journalist, I can attest to that, having worked at the Associated Press, USA Today, and other publications. Last year, Megan was part of a team that received the AP Chairman's Prize for their success in improving the distribution of data sets to member newsrooms and bureaus. Um, and that is something I got to see firsthand um, when I interned there and Megan. So, so yeah, Megan, please, I would, you know, I'm excited to have, to, to hear, to hear about your work again. And I think um, our audience will be as well. 
Sure. Thanks so much um, for having me. I really appreciate this. And basically what I, I don't have a formal presentation, but I do have a I do want to kind of walk through a little bit about what the, the last year has been like for us data journalists. I think um, in the US, honestly, our, our experiences have been very similar to those in Brazil. Um, so a lot of what Carol said rang true in terms of um, you know, the, the, the types of problems we have. And honestly, one of the chief problems we have is have, have had in the last year in data journalists as data journalists has been trying to use data to tell this story as it happens. Um, most often as data journalists, we're taking data um, that's been either collected by a, a private entity, a researcher, um, the government most often, honestly. Um, and that data is usually shaped, processed, uh, to, that takes a while to collect. And so there's oftentimes a lag. You know, We're using data a lot of times in our stories that's a year old, two years old. Obviously, that's not going to work for us in um, in COVID times, as we're trying to get a handle around what's happening as they have as things happen, and so there's a number of techniques and and things we had to overcome in the past year. Um, I'm going to walk you through a, a number of those. Um, the first I wanted to talk about. Hold on, as I share my screen. Uh, the first I want to, thing I wanted to talk about is modeling. Um, very early on in uh, the COVID crisis, what we saw was in the absence of, you know, kind of knowledge about how this was going to go, was, was just a huge number of models um, being created to try to predict um, what was going to happen next and how, um, how contagious COVID was, um, what caseloads would look like, what burdens would look like. Um, it was a little bit kind of what everyone wanted to know, but the problem was, was um, as data journalists, we were kind of being besieged by models, honestly. Um, almost every group, uh, organization, think tank, um, you know, private citizen was kind of coming up with their own COVID model. This um, is a, it, the CDC has, has ended up kind of compiling these models. Um, and, and you can see, you know, back in April of 2020, um, what we were looking at was, was models with like massively and wildly varying uh, outcomes, depending on which model um, you, were, you were choosing uh, to, to listen to. And it was a challenge for us because as data journalists, we're often pairing with newsroom um, reporters and editors across the newsroom in a large um, news organizations like at the AP, which covers the entire world and has reporters uh, embedded in all the states, but also most countries, uh, in places like the Post, where there's lots of um, journalists across the world as well. Um, what we were getting was reporters in, in Kansas were choosing one model because that's what their state was looking at, and reporters in Washington state were choosing another model. And those models didn't have actually a whole lot of relation to each other. Um, they both sometimes predicted dire scenarios, but completely different dire scenarios. And it was really Really hard to vet these models given um, the lack of true information we all had about how COVID was going to behave. Um, you know, we were kind of operating a little bit in an information vacuum last year, everyone was, about, um, you know, how it was transmitted, how, um, you know, how contagious it was, like who would be affected. Back in April and March, we, we really didn't know the answers to these questions. And so models were therefore just inherently problematic. Um, and yet they were kind of being forced upon us as a, as a society by all of these different um, means. And, and, you know, in many cases, honestly, governments were touting them as well. So, um, you know, as data journalists, a lot of our job is to vet data sources and to kind of think about data that we're using and, and adhering to in stories. And so early on, we at the AP, I, I was at the Associated Press at the time, we at the AP, um, agreed and decided that we were not going to use modeling um, and not going to base stories off modeling predictions and things like that. Um, and it was a data decision that honestly was just um, made because 
it lacked at the time the, the true science behind it. Um, a lot of these models, honestly, were being um, pushed forward by people who weren't epidemiologists, um, who didn't, um, didn't have a full grasp of even the, the science, um, the disease science. And, and honestly, it was, just, it was just too early to know. So in the absence of um, a lot of case data, which we weren't getting and in, and in the absence of being able to really rely on models um what did we have like data journalists had to be um uniquely it was a taxing year because we had to be uniquely uh really really creative in terms of what we looked at last year um to be able to tell this story in real time so you know, here are some highlights and, and kind of things I thought were interesting last year. One of the things we saw first when COVID came and first hit in the US, uh, New York City was particularly hit hard. And one of the things we were seeing was um, lots of reports that, that Manhattan was emptying out, that parts of um, Manhattan were empty. That's why we weren't seeing cases there, things like that. And I thought this was an interesting look because the idea is you get an, you get a story idea and then the, the question is how do we quantify that and I thought this story did a very good job at trying to quantify what was happening in New York City with the population changes as COVID um, struck the city so hard and so they decided to as a proxy to um, people's movement um, they looked at garbage pickups. Where was household waste dropping as a proxy for people not living there anymore and having moved out of the city to avoid um, avoid the virus? And this is a map they made very early on in the pandemic. Um, and I thought it was an interesting way to get at some of the other issues and some of the issues the city was seeing. Where were people um, staying? Um, you know, household waste is going up in a lot of places because people are at home, uh, they are hunkering down. And honestly, what it, it turned out was a lot of those dark green areas were some of the places in the city that were hardest hit by COVID. Those pink areas, um, people did depart the city for other places. Um, they might have had a, a lower caseload. Um, early on, too, we were hearing um, anecdotally like there was that there were disparities. Um, as to who the virus was affecting and um, you know what we were what we were seeing in terms of who was showing up at the hospital, who was dying from this. Uh, the data was really particularly poor on this subject, especially in the beginning, but even now that problem persists. Roughly a quarter to a third of COVID case data uh, in the US doesn't have race attached to it. So it's very, very difficult to say with any degree of certainty um, as to you know, who's really coming down with the virus. Um, you know, part of that is just the bureaucratic overload and like of of keeping these these papers um certain hospital systems certain pharmacy systems testing locations haven't kept this data so um er, very early on um we wanted to look at disparities, but it didn't exist and we couldn't find it in the caseload data because of all of the missing values. Um, we decided we learned that death data um, was less likely to be missing racial and ethnic um, data, although it still is missing at some level. But um, we were able very early on to hand collect. The other thing is this, this data wasn't um, wasn't centralized in any place. So we had to hand collect and go from state to state and city to city um, to find out where, um, what the racial toll of deaths were. So this was a like kind of mid April look at um, the percentage of deaths, um, you know, 75% of deaths in um, the District of Columbia were, um, were black people and you know the percentage versus the percentage of population 45% of the population of Washington DC is black so you can start to see that gap emerging even though we don't have a full data um, toll yet because that that data hasn't been released by many states and this 
In this case, these were the only states and the only cities that were providing or releasing that data or even collecting it at that time. Um, since then, uh, we all the states have started collecting it and the CDC has, has started collecting it as well. Um, but at the time, this data was very hard to come by and had to you know, be manually collected um, from a number of different dashboards, uh, state websites, state reports, and by calling and FOIAing different states and cities. Um, but as we get into things like this, these disparities, you also have to keep some basic data um, you know, things in mind. Um, things like the Black population in the United States and the Hispanic population in the United States um, isn't of the same age as the white population in the United States. So then you have to move into um, like higher statistical, uh, you know, issues such as age, um, adjusting your data. This is um, Connecticut was one of the first states that started looking at age adjusting its data. Um, and when you look at the deaths, um, you see that it the age adjustment makes a huge difference. Um, Hispanics and the um, the rate of deaths for Hispanics goes way up. The rate of deaths for Blacks increases even higher than what it originally was. And then the, the white death rate, um, because whites are typically significantly older, the white population of, of states is significantly older, um, you know, drops significantly. So we have to kind of keep those kinds of things in mind. A death is not a death. If a bunch of 45 year old Hispanics are dying, um, that might take more of a toll of a, on a community than an 80 year old, uh, several 80 year old white people. So, um, so that was something and, and you know, that work is honestly still going on to age adjust the death data to get a better sense of what um, each community's loss was. Um, so another way into this, because as we were as we were going for further into, um, you know, disparities and what um, the toll of COVID looked like on communities across the United States, you know, how do you get into that information? Inf into that story um, with a lack of data. One of the things that a number of news organizations um, worked on last year, and I thought it was a, a smart way to kind of walk around the problem a little bit, is looking at ex the issue of excess deaths. Um, taking basically a baseline of deaths across um, the US or across each state um, for the last three or five years, and then measuring 2020's deaths against that to see what the discrepancies there are. And basically what you find is, you know, the, the um, the axis on this is basically normal, the normal death rate. And so these peaks are above the normal death rate. And you can see the large disparities in Black, Hispanic, and Asian pop and Native American populations versus white populations. So it was another way, again, to get at the issue of what we were seeing on the ground as it was happening without having a full data picture, unfortunately, because, um, you know, in a lot of cases, COVID wasn't being marked as the cause of death in a lot of these deaths. So that was really hard to get at. In a lot of cases, we weren't able to see um, specifically death certificates or the, the death data was lagging um, by, by months for COVID deaths. So this was another way into um, what we were kind of seeing on the ground as it happened. A lot of people took different kind of slices of the excess deaths question last year to look at, um, you know, places where they weren't reporting COVID deaths, basically, but also places um, just to track things like this kind of disparity among populations or in different states. This was a project we did um, the, at the AP, we did it alongside the Marshall Project, so we worked with them on this, and we broke it down by state um, and each different racial group. Um, another technique we, uh, we, I think a lot of news organizations uh, stuck to last year was hand collecting data. Um, okay, and the lack of, 
uh, with the lack of data about a certain issue, can we, you know, create a survey methodology or hand collect data or from enough places that we can tell stories around it. So this was something we did around um, schools and, you know, as schools reopened in the fall, as the school season started in the fall of 2020, you know, what did it look like um, at, in terms of who was reopening and who was going back to school? We really wanted to see that. That's data in real time. The, you know, the National Center of Education Statistics keeps this data, will have this data, but they'll have it in about a year and a half. And what we wanted to do was try to capture who might be affected by loss of learning, who might be affected by not having technology right away um, as it was going on. So this was our method to do that. We basically um, binned the school districts. Um, they, they are binned actually in, in NCES data into four categories urban, suburban, town, and rural. So we used those categories and we picked the five largest schools in each category in each state and sent them a survey and called them and followed up with them. Um, and we ended up getting uh, roughly 700 schools uh, answering our survey and were able to then say, this was true, districts serving mostly students of color were more likely to start online. It was true across every single type of school. It was true in, in rural areas as much as it was true in urban areas or it was true in rural areas as it was in urban areas. And um, you know, this was something, and it was a trend nationwide. We also were able to follow things like um, whether students had access to the internet, whether they were given computers or tablets to use and things like that as well that um, ended up in other stories. So, you know, collecting some of this data ourselves, I think a lot of organizations ended up doing that. Um, you know, we're just helped to fill in the gaps where we didn't have comprehensive, um, even state level or national data. Uh, the best example of that is the COVID tracking project. Uh, this is a large, large um, organizational project that was run um, from the Atlantic, um, and they were they were collecting um, test positivity rates. And at some point in the U.S., test positivity rates became a huge. Um, kind of metric of how states were doing and how localities were doing in controlling the spread of COVID. So um, test positivity became a um, huge policy issue. States were starting to decide on whether they were going to reopen certain things based on test po positivity rates. The CDC was giving guidelines around what your positivity rate should be. Um, and at the end of the day, what uh, what the COVID project, tracking project came down to was that test positivity was being measured radically differently from state to state and from locality to locality. So there was, you know, one positivity formula that was set by the CDC, but in reality, what was happening was that there were three totally different ways of counting how many tests had been given, which is the denominator in any kind of positivity rate. Um, equation. So, um, you know, what, what that created was then a, a totally unequal process where you couldn't measure one state's positivity rate or one locality's positivity rate against another. Um, this was, you know, hugely problematic and honestly, um, you know, was never solved um, and really was one that speaks to one of the biggest problems with the, you know, entirety of COVID data um, across the last year, which is um, the lack of true equal systems to measure some of these things. Um, I mean, I'm just going to go on for two more minutes. I wanted to talk a little bit about as cases went up, there was a statistical need to kind of what I call flip the numbers. Um, we were always measuring things per 100,000. So in Alexandria, where I live in Virginia, you know, we have 14 cases per 100,000 people. Um, that's a really hard number for people to understand. Like, how many does that mean in my community? What does that um, really mean? Um, kind of equate to. And flipping the number to this made it much more kind of grokkable for a lot of people. We ended up um, doing that in a number of stories. This is from the New York Times. We ended up doing that in a number of stories that we did as well, um, where you flip it to, to, okay, it's one in 15 people. 
And one in 15 is, is immediately understandable to folks. We did this with um, prison data that we were collecting by hand with the Marshall Project last year, and obviously got to one in five prisoners had had COVID um, it, it, across in that year. So, um, you know, which was significantly higher at the time than, than the US average. So kind of thinking about the numbers and how you can make them more uh, understandable um, to folks is, uh, is particularly important when you're dealing with these kinds of like ongoing big numbers that just keep on getting bigger. Finally, um, want to talk about vaccination tracking because we're kind of seeing all the same COVID problems again. Um, yet another data set that is uh, problematic being reported differently state to state. Um, this is our COVID uh, vaccination tracker. Um, the Post is doing a heck of a job trying to track um, vaccinations across the US and where they're going. Um, this is a labor of many, many people and is involved writing uh, 50 state scrapers many times because the states changed radically how they were reporting the data many times, and then finally changing it to the CDC, and now the CDC has changed how they measure things several times. Um, so, you know, we're, we do the best we can, but honestly, um, a lot of this COVID data as it's coming out is, is changing literally by the, the day. Um, you know, there's oftentimes new new fields in the data each day from the CDC that mean different things. How do they track um, J and J, um, you know, single dose vaccinate vaccines versus double dose vaccines? What does that mean for people fully vaccinated or having received one dose? Um, you know, it, it's, uh, it's been a very difficult process and continues to be a very difficult thing to track um, all along. And so I will stop now so we can talk. Thank you, Megan. Um, yeah, I, I mean that was that was that was a really good overview. I think of just how journal, data journals have been figuring out not just the scope of stories, um, but also finding untold stories and statistics during this pandemic um, and contextualizing them. I, in particular, I you know, I didn't realize until you mentioned it that uh, you're right. Uh, it, it, sorry. I had noticed, I think, um, in the back of my head, the flipping of statistics to make it more understandable. Um, and it's good to hear from you how that was like a conscious decision or how thought was put into um, that at newsrooms. So yeah, so um, again, Mark, Carol, Megan, thank you for your presentations. Uh, we're now gonna move into a more sort of free form panel discussion time. Um, and I thought I would kick it off with a question about you know data pre presentation and how reporting during the pan pandemic has sort of really brought this intersection of science communication and news you can use right um, from the general public. So I think in some ways COVID the COVID pandemic has been a real crucible for the field. Um, Mark, I'm curious, you know, from the academic perspective, have you seen unique forms of storytelling or ways of presenting information from newsrooms that? you're excited to maybe integrate into your lessons plans, um, but also conversely, have you also seen some real teaching moments where maybe something was confusing or reporting oversimplified important scientific details? Yeah, I think, I think um, uh, so uh, I'm teaching a data visualization class now and we um, have, one of the things we did was to go back over the year and just look at how the graphical forms have changed. Um, at the beginning, it was, um, as Megan pointed out, lots of sort of exponential curves that fanned out in a variety of ways. Um, uh, and and, um, and as I, I put in my presentation, various kinds of attempts at mapping and, and trying to just communicate scale. Um, we spent a lot of time, actually, um, the, a number of news organizations did some work around uh, when the, the U.S. hit the 500,000 number, trying to make that number um, relatable somehow. Um, the Washington Post in particular had, a, had a, a kind of theatricalized piece that, uh, that had people on, a bu on buses and as you scrolled, buses were going by, you know, as you tried to count and count and count and you thought, well, this is impossible. This is never going to get us to the total. And then after a long period of scrolling, um, after so many buses, each bus had like 51 people on them. Uh, you, after 
like a minute of scrolling, you end up with one day worth of, of casualties. And then they flip over from buses to, to, to if you were to, all the buses were to be lined up on a, on a street or on a, on, a, on a stretch of highway from two familiar places like New York and Philadelphia or something. But the, 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 ways, in which, the ways in which we shifted and the different strategies that went along to try to figure out, even just like getting the, the public accustomed to a log scale seemed like something that had to be talked about and thought about. And, and so yeah, there were, there were a lot of teachable moments in thinking out how we kind of worked through and presented not only what we knew, but what we didn't know. Right, like what, what, where are the, where are the gaps, um, and and sometimes, many times, the uncertainties that were present were not sort of statistical and couldn't be thought of in statistical terms. You just had to, you had to find some way to express what you didn't know. Um, yeah, I'll leave it there. Thanks, um, and sort of zooming out into the journalism industry as a whole, um, Carol mentioned the need. Uh, for journalist organizations to collaborate because of data issues. Um, you know, Carol and also Megan, have you, do you think that the competition versus cooperation tension, do you think that will change the way um, media outlets are maybe working in competition with each other, but also together? Um, and of course, Carol, let's start with you because uh, I think in the US, we've got a very US focus and I'm curious to see how this might play out in other countries. I think, um... I think this collaboration is something that we've been, we've never seen, seen before. And I think there's a good side to competition because we, um, we actually improve everybody's coverage if we know that somebody else is doing something that putting in an effort to doing something special. So we wanna do that too. Um, and also because we have so many stories out there that need to be told and if everybody keeps telling the same stories, then there's a lot of stories that never get told. Um, so the more variety and the more competition, the better. But we do have, we have seen a big collaboration and a growing collaboration, especially, especially in data journalism, because data, um, doing data is very hard, programming, learning languages. So we do have, um, we do help each other. Um, we have different WhatsApp groups with journalists that are covering the same thing. Obviously, we're not sharing our stories ideas, but if somebody needs help using the database that I know how to use, they can just ask me and which field, which variable they, they need to use, and I'll, I'll let them know. Um, so I think this collaboration only helps out, especially um, because the more people pushing for transparency, the better data we're going to have, uh, and that's going to be better for everybody. Thanks, Carol. Um, Megan, how about you? You know, you've, uh, I, I know that the AP collaborated with, you, you actually uh, brought up, you know, collaboration with the Marshall Project, also with Rockbeat. Um, do you think that the COVID pandemic will be changing the way collaboration is done in, in me in the US? Yeah, I think um, in the in the biggest sense of the, the terms, it, it really needs to um, move to a conversation of how do we, um, how do we all work together to verify and establish these basic data sets, right? Like um, we all kind of needed a lot of the same things last year. Um, and it, we all spent a significant amount of time trying to get or build or maintain those basic things. Um, you know, vaccine tracking is, uh, is taking up a huge chunk of a lot of newsrooms time and effort right now. Um, so how do we best organize and make this a, a universal and singular effort, um, I think still needs to be worked out a little bit more. But it, it, we certainly moved much closer to um, you know, sharing resources, working together, things like that. The AP, you know, we, we released a bunch of data sets to, for, um, for newsrooms to use um, and made a lot of those publicly available, completely publicly available. Some of them were just for our members, some of them were just for everybody, um, just to try to lower that like bar uh, to entry to just do the basic things. Um, but there's, there's a lot more effort needs to be you know, made in this area. I, I think there could have been even more collaboration than there was in the, in the last year. 
as always, right? There's always more room for collaboration, less competition. Um, let's see. Uh, it seems like the audience is also interested in in not just right. So not just how um, you know thinking about how this experience might shape um, journalism as a field. Um, so you know, one of just thinking also about like how how it might be pushing innovation in data journalism as well. Um, we've seen that some of the most effective cases for data journalism in the pandemic has been conveying and inter interpreting case counts. But what are some of the other big picture opportunities for data journalism um, as we move forward from the pandemic? Um, let's see, who, who should we start with? Um, Megan, do you have thoughts on this? I actually thought Carol had a pretty interesting, I mean, I think, you know, in, in many countries, um, we kind of had to be big advocates for public and, and open data. I don't know how much those um, arguments were heard, but I mean, what we saw was a lot of governments doing dashboards where there was no raw data behind the dashboards or the raw data was inaccessible behind the dashboards. Um, you know, Tableau sites where you couldn't actually download the raw data from them um, using a variety of different sites. Uh, you know, every, every state had their own dashboard. It was completely different. It included different metrics. Um, so there was very little standardization around all of that. And yeah, the, the question does become like, where, where can data journalism become an advocate for standardization and organization um, of, of some of these things? I'm not quite sure where we fit in, but um, it certainly seemed like I would be interested in hearing both Carol and Mark's thoughts on this as to, as to how we we push for better, more comprehensive and, uh, and more you know, standardized data. Thanks. Yeah, Carol, what do you think are the opportunities for data journalism um, in Brazil? I think we have a lot of opportunity because we have a lot of room to, to improve. Uh, I don't know how easy it's going to be to improve uh, because it's really, really hard. Like, for example, the testing data, there is a database. We could have the open raw data. We could, we could see how many tests are being done every day and everything, but there is no data. And I tried for about two months in many different ways to get this data. And, and I asked in the press um, conferences when they were actually doing press conferences at the ministries, like, why don't we have that data? And they say like, oh, we can't put um, data with personal, personal data from people um, up online. I was like, I didn't ask for personal data. I asked for the anonymous database. You know you have it. You could do it, but you won't do it. So we actually have, um, we've had a, a forum of associations asking for more transparency. We have the Open Knowledge Foundation in Brazil. They actually had a ranking with different indicators of transparency. Um, that actually helped a lot of local governments, state level governments, um, improve their transparency because of these indicators, but that also had a backlash. So there was other states or cities that took back on their transparency levels because they looked bad on some rankings. So they said, oh, I'm just not going to do anything for them. So that we've seen both things happen. I think that we actually, Sean had a question here um, on the Q&A that I think kind of matches this. Um, uh, I think that as we are able to automate the data that we have and, and try to find ways to get that data quickly turned into information that we can use in journalism, I think we start advancing naturally and then we can try and get like, why don't we have that data in this format so we can do that with that, with that sort of data as well. And what we can do as well is we can... Um, I'm going to use this word, but I don't know if it's, we can arm the reporters and the editors and the people that are interviewing the authorities with this data fast so they can try and fact check in real life, in real time, when the authority says something. And then if I hear someone say something, I know the data and I say, no, that's wrong. And then I can quickly inform the person that's there in the press conference like that's not that's not correct and then they can question them in real time um and and so this is a way that we can 
use data as I'm not I'm going to use the word weapon because I can't think of any other word, but I don't think it's a war. I think I think society is only going to improve with this, um, but it's it's as a weapon to to tell the authorities that they can't push certain narratives just the way they want to, because the data will help us not allow that to happen, or at least we can show both sides and keep the public informed. And I think the public pressure is the one that also helps um, get authorities to actually comply to laws, because we have transparency laws that um, people are, are abusing or ignoring nowadays. Wow, I think um, I know someone had also asked in the Q and A about um, impact, and I, I can't think of a more sort of direct form of impact than being able to question authorities in real time about the information they're presenting to the public. Um, and so, okay, thank you for your perspectives, Megan and Carol, on on how newsrooms, how the field is changing in newsrooms. Mark, you know, this also extends into academia because the Brown Institute, for instance, um, supports me innovation in media. I mean, you mentioned these grants specifically geared towards COVID projects. Um, you know, how has the pandemic changed the way academia supports innovation in media um, and especially data journalism innovation? So, I, I mean, you know, uh, we had had um, a lot of programming set up uh, for 2020 because it was going to be the year of data. Right. It was um, it was uh, 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 the, the fiftieth anniversary of Earth Day, so you have climate change you can talk about. Um, the Olympics were going to happen. Um, the census was happening. Like it was it was just a, a, a just bristling with data opportunities and to to bring in new stories. And then and then the pandemic happened, and everything focused focused on that. I think one of the things that um, that that at the core, like, so I, I get asked to teach statistics in the J school from time to time in reporting classes or whatever. And so, you know, using COVID as a as a backdrop is is an interesting is an interesting angle. Um, and the the issue is that if you want to touch any epidemiology, you're almost immediately hit with a partial differential equation, and the students go, uh. And so, so you, see, so you don't kind of want to go there, but but it. But but what it suggests is that, um, uh, or what we started to think about is that maybe it, it's suggesting having um, sort of a tighter a tighter bind bond rather with with sort of experts, whether they be epidemiologists or other sort of technical people in the technical field, and not just have them appear in the publication under the opinion pages, which is where a lot of people present their research, and not just have them quoted as a source, but have them as collaborators in building up stories um, and sort of creating a kind of, of shared language. A second thing that that um, we've been we've been looking at at, at Brown is, is ways to try to bring more um, undergraduate STEM students into journalism, right? So that you have um, a, a, a basic kind of um, uh, sort of data and sort of modeling awareness um, uh, coming into the journalistic practice. And something really interesting happens when those two work together. One of the projects that I mentioned, the, the documenting COVID-19 is pulling all of these emails from, from local um, and state health departments and, and governments to try to see who knew what when, right? And to take all of that, to create timelines, to think about, you know, what, what, what data sources are, are sort of implicit in here that we can start to tease apart to tell a story. Um, the team has, has been really successful in bringing on not just sort of investigative journalists, but also um, students from our dual degree who are both journalists as well as computer scientists who have the capacity to ask questions of the data on their own, um, but then also answer them on their own and then work, work in a team. So I think I think I think this goes kind of back to your collaboration question a bit, but but collaborations um, sort of outside of journalism and um, and and also sort of helping to to kind of advance the field by by bringing in students who have more traditional STEM training. Thanks. Um, great to get perspectives from both newsroom and also in academia. Um, let's see. So we've got. Okay, we've got, I think we've got time for one more question uh, with input from everyone. 
Um, you know, perhaps the most broad question I've seen all day about data journalism, especially in the context of the pandemic. Um, what would you all say have been the biggest technical challenges to data journalism, but also the biggest social challenges? It's been a pretty roller coaster year all around the world in terms of not just the pandemic, but also politics, um, social conflict, stuff like that. So I think he froze. Yeah, Arena, we can't hear you if, if, uh if you're still talking. You can type the question. If you're still present, you can type the question in. Maybe you could. Well, while Arena comes back from her technical difficulties, um, Megan, would you uh, take a shot at the social uh, aspect of the question Arena just asked? I do think there's been a challenge and and as Mark said, just um, you know, training people to understand some of these um visualizations and um you know terms and things we were we were throwing at data this year, things like a log scale, things like um excess death calculations. You know, these are complicated ideas um that you know the average person isn't familiar with, and it's literally are kind of some of our only ways into measuring what's happening. And so, um, you know, we saw a lot of really good, I think, very high level step backs in terms of walking people through um, some of these types of visualizations, some of these types of models. I honestly thought some of the best and, and most successful data journalism of the year were things that stuck with extremely simple idea. Um, and that also took a very high level look um, you know, at, at what was happening, because the daily, you know, shuffle and the daily, um, you know, increases and where caseloads were and things like that was an incredibly hard thing to just kind of keep a thumb on. Um, so where we where we did well is in slow down, let's explain this um, really closely. I thought, you know, El Pais had a, had a great explainer in the fall about how um, coronavirus moved through the air. Um, and it was a fantastic step through with visualizations. It was very data um, driven in the sense that they had clearly done the math behind it. It didn't show up as a data story. It was literally like, here are three scenarios. You walk into a bar, you walk into a friend's home, things like that. And here's what your chances kind of are um, because of, you know, things, issues like ventilation. So when you're talking about, um, you know, how we express things, I think it's upon all of us as data journalists to kind of take a really slow look at, can we, can we step back? Can we simplify this? Can we explain this to people, um, you know, in a, in a very logical and kind of, um, you know, coherent way, um, at, at a very high level? so that they're going to understand not only this this graphic or this story but also stories going forward on this subject. Thank you. That 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 idea of making things tangible through simulations is um, I think an aspect that um, has thrived in in, uh, in particular parts of um, uh, the reporting but it's not it's not prevalent everywhere yet. So I think that's really important. Carol, do you have a, anything to add there? Yeah, I, I agree with the simplicity factor. Um, before the pandemic, uh, two months before, I switched from online news to television news, and it's very, very different. And the audience is also very different. Um, before um, on online news, you have someone who wants to click on the story and they, they can read the whole story or they can read only a part of the story. They can spend two minutes reading it or five minutes reading it or 30 seconds reading it. But on the television, when it goes on television, you have your, your graph, a person is going to look at it in 10 seconds. So they have to understand what's going on. So there is a, it's a very difficult process to simplify the information in a way 
that the audience um, can understand in such a quick way. And it's also, um, I think it's, it's, so it's a challenge and I learned a lot from it doing television with the editors because they have a very hard, um, a hard job in translating all the data and all the information into something that you can watch with your eyes and you can be informed by it. And they only have two or three hours to put the story together. So it's very demanding. Um, but also the audience is a lot broader. So it's the people that go out, that have been able, that have had to go out and take the bus to keep working uh, because they don't have any other way of supporting their families, so they have to risk themselves. There are people, there are people who are living six people in the same household, um, three generations. They have to protect the elderly that live with them. So these are the people that are most impacted by the pandemic. So talking directly to them is pretty much a privilege. So um, I don't really get frustrated if I think like oh, I'm going to do this beautiful graph and you know, like a flow chart or a box plot. And I can't do that because I can only use bars or lines. Um, but I know that that's the way that I can communicate that information. So I think, um, um, I think, I think that's the most important thing of our job. So I don't get so frustrated about that anymore. Well, thank you. Thank you. So Mark, I guess, um, Maybe we'll give you the last word, oh, and no. um, and and something that. Um, so do you have do you have any thoughts on? So we have science here, we have communication and journalism. What? How does that all wrap up to communicating the emotional impact of what's happening? What's the challenge for the scientists? Right. So so. Uh, Emotional impact is an is an interesting one, right? So so the um, uh, you know I'd mentioned, for example, the um, the Washington Post piece with the train first with the buses. You you should have a look at this uh, work, but first with the buses and then stretches of of you know if you were to line all those buses up to try to give you a sense of what five hundred thousand people like what what does the number five hundred thousand mean? And I'm not sure that emotion for emotion's sake is what is what we're what we're after. What what data journalism does provide, though, is um, an opportunity if it's there, right, to to think through what's the data source that you're going to look at to capture a particular situation. I mean, Megan already mentioned like the emptying out of Manhattan and how we might like pick a data set to 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 to, to portray that, right? And and so there's a in the same way that that you know a, a good journalist picks their sources, a data journalist would pick their sources. There's a there's almost an I don't want to say aesthetic, but there's a quality there that will speak to people in ways. So it's it's not just how it's presented, although that's important, but it's also what what data have you chosen to help portray that particular situation, and. You know, I, I would say that at the end of the day, especially with COVID, I feel like our responsibility is to help people make better decisions about their actions, about the the health and well-being of their families um, as a result. And you know, those stories. Then, I think um, the note that I wanted to end on was a statistical one, which is um, those stories have embedded within them uncertainties and being able to communicate, I mentioned this before, but being able to communicate honestly what you do and don't know so that people can, you know, make appropriate choices, can can hopefully make a, a better informed choices. Because again, the, the data, as, as you've heard, the data are in various formats. Some of the numbers that were quoted or that, that we keep using don't make any sense. Right, like the proportion of, of vaccines that, or the proportion of tests that are positive doesn't really tell you much because you don't know what the downstairs, like what's affecting that from day to day and who's showing up to get tested and all of that. So, you know, okay, if that number's, if that number's high and these other numbers are high, then yeah, okay. So maybe it says something bad is happening, but like we're, we're, we're constantly sort of making these these sorts of, of, of trade-offs. And I think the, the sources of data are 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 are, are one thing that, that a, a, a journalist can um, look to and sort of be creative about to help make it real for people. 
Well, thank you. So, Irina, you're back. So you do, in fact, get the last word. Do you have any wrap up that you'd like to um, leave us with? Thanks, Joe. Yep, I'm, I'm on my phone. Thank goodness for cell towers, even when electricity or the internet goes out. Um, yeah, I just want to thank Megan, Carol, and Mark again so much for taking the time to chat with us. Um, and the audience for taking the time to listen to the art about data journalism. Um, I think it's one of the best things in the world, and hopefully you do too. Um, and I'm going to hand it back over to Joe for uh, announcements. Um, and also, Joe, uh, one of our audience members that give interest to others in this talk. All right. Well, thank you. That's it for today. Um, we really appreciate the time and the expertise of our speakers. Uh, thank you for the audience, for your willingness to, um, to be here and uh, for putting up with our minor technical glitches. Please uh, watch the website, uh, the COVID Data Forum website. That's COVID19-data-forum.org for information about when the video for this conference will be available and for upcoming events. So thank you all. Please uh, stay safe and take care. Thank you. Bye.